What's up everyone, in today's video the creepy nostalgia is back from the past as we look at more classic Goosebumps covers turned into Lego. And in this episode we have 6 covers and before going any further, thank you all so much for the recommendations on episode 1. I read all of your comments and as you'll see, they definitely influenced which books I picked for this episode. And if I still don't get to the one you wanted to see, then make sure to comment again, as who knows, if this episode does well, we may even have episode 3. To start on a high note, we have Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. The 13th book from the original series tells the story of Jerry, a boy who moves into a new house where he finds an old piano. He signs up for lessons, but the piano and his creepy teacher, Dr. Shriek, may be more than Jerry bargained for. For the build, this piano is probably my favorite piece of this entire episode because of how clean I think the final product is. It uses a lot of different building techniques to make all of the sides smooth, even the bottom. For the white keys, I use jumper plates because their shape is slightly different than regular plates. The bottom of jumper plates actually have a really small indentation that runs the length of the piece, so when a lot of them are stacked on top of each other, you can see the separation between the pieces a lot easier than you can with just regular plates together. So that really helps the keys on the piano look distinct, but it did take up a lot of jumper plates. This piano actually has 28 keys counting both the black and white. I thought it was really important to make sure the black keys were shorter than the white ones to get an accurate look, but I knew I couldn't just use regular plates, so I decided to use these clicking hinge pieces. The interior of the piano uses quite a few different snot bricks that allowed me to build in different directions. The entire piano is right at 8 studs wide, so it's actually really close to looking like its minifigure scale. During the filming of this video, I actually went ahead and made the legs only one brick tall, just to make it a bit lower to the ground, which I think helps with that just a bit. Over the keys, I put in some clip pieces to hold up music, and that piece actually comes from Rolf from the Muppets minifigures, which as you'll see actually turned out to be quite a useful series for this video, oddly enough. The backdrop for this one is easily the simplest, as it's just red bricks. For the floor, I used dark red and then transitioned to regular red for the backdrop. And of course, on the top, I threw some hands on the keys, and placing those hands was probably the most frustrating thing of this entire episode, as they were falling off constantly, and trying to get good photos and footage of them was a complete pain. Overall, I think the final product looks pretty simple, but accurate to the original, and I'm definitely keeping that piano built, because it could fit into a ton of city customs. If you'd like to see a tutorial for the piano, comment down below, and if there's enough demand, I'll show you guys how to build it with a video. Next up, we have to look at the absolute most requested cover, undisputedly, One Day at Horrorland. And I have to say, before seeing all of your comments, I wasn't expecting it, but you guys blew me away with just how much you requested it, so I really didn't have any choice in the matter. In One Day at Horrorland, a family goes on vacation only to wind up getting lost on their way to an amusement park. Unable to find their original destination, the family ends up at Horrorland, which serves as an upside down or Twilight Zone version of Disneyland, where instead of fun and games, you're greeted with monsters and danger, where all of the rides are sinister and you'll be lucky if you ever get out of the park alive. The most iconic element of the cover is definitely the horned goblin monster, so to recreate him, I've used a goblin head from The Lord of the Rings and the stone horns from the gargoyle from series 14, which I thought turned out pretty well. I think the head should have been a bit brighter to match the original, so maybe if if I had a green goblin head in the lime color, it could have looked better, but I worked with what I had. The winding jagged tree on the left side was a really fun build, and it's composed of a lot of different clip arms and other elements, such as the wands from Harry Potter. Since it's made out of so many clips, it's really poseable, so that's kind of fun as well. For the gravel path, I used a lot of different green and gray pieces to simulate the look of the original, leading off to the horror land skyline, where you'll find a ferris wheel made out of a lego wheel, a roller coaster clipped into place with a tube piece, and various tints. I used those silver pieces just to make things pop a bit more, and I used a couple of small TIE Fighter clear dish pieces for a couple of the tent's tops. For the background, I tried to recreate the twilight haze of the original cover, so I used a lot of plates to show the gradual fade of color. Of course, I didn't have an actual Horrorland sticker or anything like that, so I just made the sign with wood planks for the goblin to stand behind. If you're enjoying the video so far, be sure to subscribe as I'm constantly making new LEGO content such as creations like this and top 10 lists. 
for our third entry, we have Ghost Camp. And this was another one that was a ton of fun as it has so many different elements on the cover that were fun to translate into Lego. When Alex and Harry show up for summer camp, they're greeted by a bit more than they bargained for as the other campers just seem to be a bit off and maybe even a little less alive than one would expect. For this build, I started with the logs in the front and then just built my way back. So those hinge into place where they can be angled up and then behind them, you'll find some mounds of grass built at varying heights to give everything more depth. On the original cover, the campers are all wearing the same shirt, but I didn't have four or five of a single torso, so I just kept everything red and picked out different torsos that I thought would be fitting, and tried to include some details where I could, like leaving off the arms for the girl in the tank top. Additionally, each camper has a unique hat. To build the figures, I used clear heads, popped out the hands, and then replaced their legs with clear bricks, so I guess none of them are wearing pants, but don't think about that. I didn't have a camp sign, but I did have these hiking and boating stickered pieces that I think came from a friend set that I got in a Lego lot. Behind the campers, you'll find a hedge of bushes followed by an ominous layer of fog descending onto the camp built out of blue bricks and plates, which played a pivotal role within the book. Above that, you can see some cabins off in the distance, along with some trees and the American flag. I don't usually do micro builds, so getting to make some of those up, where you're only using three or four pieces, was pretty fun. Up in the sky, you'll also find lightning striking the camp, which I made using the Star Wars Force lightning pieces. I really wish I could have used a light brick to light those up a bit, but unfortunately, I couldn't find out a way to let the light through from the backside. The fourth entry on our list is The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, which came very early in the Goosebumps series, being only the fifth book released all the way back in 1993. When Gabe goes vacationing with his family in Egypt, he winds up inside one of the pyramids where he finds himself wrapped up in an ancient mummy legend. Out of the six entries on this list, the mummy build is definitely the simplest and most straightforward with both its number of pieces and techniques, but the cover is an iconic original, so I still wanted to give it some attention. Since you can't see much detail about what the tomb actually looks like from the original cover, I took some liberties and just built it in a way that I thought would look okay. So behind the mummy's head, you'll find the sunken in circle where I started an alternating pattern of dark blue and gray. I then use that for the rest of the tomb, which is mostly composed of slopes and inverted slopes, along with some profile bricks for the rest of the backdrop. The mummy minifigure comes from Scooby-Doo. I think a different mummy like the one from Pharaoh's Quest or Monster Fighters may have been more accurate, but once again, I decided to go with what I already had. One thing that I like about this build is that it works both standing up or laying flat, and this is me at 2 a.m. when I need a snack. For number 5, I've built The Headless Ghost, a story that takes place in Wheeler Falls, where you'll find the dreaded Hill House where the Headless Ghost is rumored to roam. Protagonists Dwayne and Stephanie, the local pranksters, set out in search of the lost head. Now sometimes when choosing what to build, I see one thing and know that it will translate well into Lego, and that's what has happened here. When looking at the cover, I noticed the ghost's head and immediately thought of the hairpiece used for Ned Leeds and Professor Flitwick. I also saw that the ghost had a frilly neck collar, which made me think of William Shakespeare, a piece that I've never used to, in a build before. So I was excited to try it and started from there. For the rest of the minifigure, I used Darth Vader's head and the Witch King's torso so in legs from the Lord of the Rings, all of which I think turned out really well, making for a really accurate resemblance to the style of the original cover. One thing I knew was going to be a challenge with this build was the banisters for the staircase. If you've ever made your own customs, you'll know that trying to build at angles with Lego pieces is a challenge, especially when trying to get multiple pieces to line up without any gaps. So that's what I was facing when trying to figure out the handrail and banisters, and it took me three or four tries, but I was lucky enough to find a way to have the handrail connect at an angle while also laying flush against the support beams. I also took this opportunity to bust out some of the Spider-Man web pieces for some of the cobwebs, and one of my favorite small details of this entire episode is that I was able to get a light brick right behind the flame of the candle, and I think that just adds to the spooky atmosphere. Around the back of the build, you'll find some additional detail where I've built a hallway with a creepy statue, another inclusion from Rolf the Muppet, and the floorboards are removable as well, under which you'll find a skeleton and a rat, along with a beating heart. The first person to tell me the reference to the heart in the floorboards will get their comment pinned on this video. If you need a hint, it's from a story you most likely read in middle or high school that definitely fits along with the spooky theming of Goosebumps. For a bonus fact, the name Hill House found in the book is a reference to both Shirley Jackson's original work, The Haunting of Hill House, as well as the Vincent Price film House on Haunted Hill, both of which released in 1959. And for the last entry on this list, we have another one of my favorites from this episode, The Girl Who Cried Monster, which focuses on Lucy, a girl who just can't stop making up tall tales. So when she realizes that her librarian is a shape-shifting, fly-eating monster, she's really in for it when no one will believe her. 
and for this book, I probably wouldn't have picked it for this episode as I was planning to do a more recognizable cover, but as I was building, my wife wanted to help, and she ended up picking out this one, and we just went with it. And I'll say that I'm really happy we did, because I think it translated into LEGO surprisingly well. To start, we can look at the librarian, Mr. Mortman. For his bald head, I'm using Alfred's from the Lego Batman movie. George Costanza's in black would have been more accurate, but I don't have the Seinfeld Lego set. For his face, I'm using Danny Niedermeyer's from Jurassic World. I wish that he did look just a bit creepier, like Dennis Nedry's face from Jurassic Park, but unfortunately I don't have that figure. But still, I mean, I think it's pretty creepy that he's sitting by himself in a library with a huge smile on his face as he looks at his afternoon snack of bugs. For Mr. Mortman's body, I used Dr. Bunsen Honeydew's torso since it had a wide tie that adds to the minifigure looking fat. On his table, you'll find some books and another bug inside of a jar. The table is pretty straightforward, it has a blue tablecloth, and to flip the bricks around, I like to use these pin pieces that can insert into pieces with holes, allowing you to build out in two directions, or in this case, connect the legs of the table to the floor. Under the table, you'll find a magenta and black patterned rug, and all of the walls of the library are bookshelves. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video with the piano keys, I used jumper plates for the books since it makes each one look a bit more distinct. However, it did take a ton of those pieces. Every once in a while on the bookshelves, I also left a gap to have the books knock over a bit and included some other small details like a spider and another bug jar. Just outside the library, you'll find Lucy with a look of horror on her face as she watches Mr. Mortimer dig into his snack. Just behind her, there's a red wall to match the original cover. And with that, we've once again come to the end of our episode. If you haven't seen it already, after this video you can go back and watch episode 1. These Goosebumps covers take a ton of time from the building to the Photoshop of the covers and editing, but at the same time, they are a ton of fun, and I like seeing the end results in all of your comments, telling your memories of the series and your suggestions and compliments, so thank you all for that. There's definitely more that could be built, so continue to leave your suggestions down below. I still haven't gotten to some of the most iconic covers like Monster Blood and Haunted Mask, and I also like all of your unique suggestions. In the first episode, a ton of people recommended Calling All Creeps, which is definitely not one that I would have thought would be popular. So go ahead and give me all of your ideas this time around as well, and we'll see if we can work out a part three. And until next time, see you later.